We have a fun <coughs> format for you guys today. Um, we'll let the guys introduce themselves and then we'll go through a uh, few questions that, uh, that we came up with. Um, I'll start out by apologizing that my dear friend Jesse Prodman cannot make it today. He's, he's not feeling well and, and he had a sick child that he had to rush home to as well. So, um, so he isn't here, but uh, we have uh, maybe even better <laughs> um, a replacement. Uh, so, so Mark will introduce himself in a second. I also want to let you guys know after our kind of predetermined questions, we will take questions from you guys. Um, so with that, why don't I start with Ken, why don't you introduce yourself sure. first? Sure, I'm Ken Hui. I, uh, I work in EMC's cloud solutions team and my focus is basically helping EMC build out their OpenStack solution strategy. Mark? Hey, I'm Mark Van Oppen, and uh, I work with Blue Box in Seattle, and I'm tasked with helping our legacy customers move to Blue Box Cloud and uh, get them successfully onboarded over the following months. Great. Mark? And I'm Amar Kapadia, and hopefully if our branding has worked, you <laughs> should all know I'm from Mirantis. I'm responsible for product marketing. And I'm Lisa Marie Amphi. I am with HP's cloud team. I run the OpenStack Solutions Marketing, and I also run a lot of the uh, user community activities. I run the user group in the SF Bay area, and, um, and I just wrote a book on OpenStack. You can download it for free from hppress.com. So um, lots of stuff. Uh, we all work very closely with OpenStack. Most of us work upstream, I would say, um, with OpenStack as well. So, uh, so when Jesse and I uh, got together, of course, at a bar in Seattle to figure out the the format of this and the questions, um, of course, they were also written on a, uh, well, it wasn't a cocktail napkin, it was a um, coaster, but just as well, still official, coasters count. Uh, and so we came up with five myths of OpenStack. Um, you know, a little leeway here, but uh, we figured we would use that as a starting point to start our conversation, we'll call it, um, and then um, maybe shoot some holes in these myths, or maybe you guys will agree that, uh, they, that they are myths. Um, so I will start with the first one, uh, which we thought would be nice and fun. The uh, OpenStack is the same as VMware. This is myth number one. Um, and maybe one of the questions is, should OpenStack add more features to be more like VMware? So um, why don't we start with Marantis on that one? So let me first start with sort of the dramatic answer, and then we'll, we can drill down. So the dramatic answer is VMware and OpenStack are obviously not the same. Everybody uh, knows that. And the difference in one word is tickets, right? Uh, if you look at what's the main problem VMware was solving, it's <coughs> workload deployment onto one machine, right? Consolidating it onto one machine. And if you look at OpenStack, if you had to boil it down to just one benefit, in my mind, it's IT as a service, which ultimately leads to IT as a code. So uh, going back to the ticket example, if you are in the VMware world, uh, we find that most customers, their processes are still manual, still use tickets. It takes anywhere from two to 26 weeks to get their machines. They're committed for you know, four to five years. And on the other side, it's, uh, it's self-service. From my perspective and from the interactions with our customers, the perception is that OpenStack is a replacement for, M for VMware and is mature and is uh, comparable. It's, it's, it's something that uh, is of the same mold. Uh, we have to educate our customers often uh, that this is a community-backed technology. This is something that is not uh, a, a product delivered by a single entity in a single company. It, it's coming from a variety of sources and, and it's being uh, pushed and developed by thousands of, of contributors. And fundamentally that makes for a different experience and it's still in its infancy. Comparing it to a technology that's been in production at scale for years is an unfair comparison and not something that uh, is really charitable to OpenStack. It's not, it's not something that's even really uh, not a fair playing field. How many of you here are on the audience are looking to deploy OpenStack in place of a VMware environment or looking into doing that? Only a few. Oh, that's okay, a few hands. So um, uh, let me, I've actually been quite fond of saying since the beginning of this year that 2015 it will be the year of failed OpenStack deployments, right? 
<laughs> and the, the, the folks who raise their hands, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the fault will be you. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the problem, with, the problem with trying to deploy OpenStack in place of VMware has nothing to do with the maturity level of, op of OpenStack, actually. It's basically this idea, it's basically taking something that was never designed, right, to run workloads that VMware runs, and say, I'm gonna, I wanna shove that workload in anyway. It's kinda like taking, you know, it would be like me taking a, you know, my daughter's bike and saying I'm gonna do NASCAR racing with it. Right? Because that's what you're basically doing. You, OpenStack is designed, and it's always been designed, right, to run AWS type workloads, what they call cloud native. It was never designed to run Oracle. It was never designed to be highly resilient. So by you trying to shove um, a, high, a application that needs high infrastructure resiliency into OpenStack, you're basically, um, you're basically setting yourself up to fail. And that's what I'm seeing today. I'm actually seeing a lot of failed deployments from enterprises that insist that they want to try to run, uh, use OpenStack to just run all of their current VMware apps. You know, I, I would also like to say, though, I think 2015 will also be the year of successful OpenStack deployments. <laughs> Some right? of those. Right? <laughs> Come on, we have to go there. There are successful OpenStack deployments today, as we know, large, large production environments. But not running, not trying to replace VMware, or all of VMware, right? That was the, that was the caveat you yeah. had. But you know, it is interesting. I just came out of a meeting with, a, with one of our large mm -hmm. customers this morning who, uh, they're a service provider, and they are actually trying to do exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. But they do need the resiliency, and they do need the, you know, the high availability yep. and all of those things. But I think the customers that we talk to, I think, um, just gonna back up a little bit from the answers mm -hmm. I heard, you know, cloud is not virtualization, right? And mm -hmm. there's still a lot of customers that we talk to yep. that kind of have this myth. So I think we need to start there when we talk to a lot of customers and, and educate customers. Cloud is not virtualization. It's a lot more than that. And I think when people want to start deploying applications and doing really interesting things, mm -hmm. you know, taking more advantage of the hardware, taking more advantage of the environment that those applications are running in, you know, I think this is where OpenStack is, is really gonna start kicking butt. So can I disagree with Ken? Um, and and we're supposed to be disagreeing, that's <laughs> Please right. Please do, yeah. Jesse instructed uh, us. The follow-up point to what I said earlier, uh, which was that these are two different technologies, means that they can actually work well together. So I think uh, 2015 will also be an year where a lot of people cloudify their vSphere environment using OpenStack. So I think they, they'll work well, and if you have what EMC calls, uh, you guys call it generation 2.5 and 3 mm -hmm. applications, right? If you have 2.5, generation 2.5 applications, which are not cloud native, uh, keep running it on vSphere and run, use OpenStack to, to cloudify it. And if you have generation three, feel free to use different hypervisors like uh, KVM. That's the power of OpenStack, right? Choice. Yeah, so I, I actually would agree with you. In this. Okay. It's just that when I talk to customers who want to go to OpenStack and say they want to replace VMware, they're not looking to run vSphere. They're, they're looking, they've not paid yeah. licensing on EXX. They want to use KVM, and that's where the problem lies, right? So I used to be at Rackspace, and uh, on the OpenStack team, I, I spent half my time talking, out of customers, talking customers out of using OpenStack, because I didn't want them to have a bad experience trying to use OpenStack, and try to help them understand where, would be the, where there's a good fit and where there isn't a good fit. And would you consider the best path forward to be proper education of the customers on the, the use case and best fit for OpenStack in comparison? I mean. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, need to, it's, it's getting, I think we need to educate customers better. I, I do think things are getting a little complicated, because I also, what I'm seeing since in the last few summits is as more enterprises get into OpenStack, there is, I think at this point, almost an unstoppable momentum to say, whatever, whatever, you, whatever VMware has as features to run Platform 2 or legacy apps, we're gonna put it into KVM and OpenStack. And I, right now, the momentum, I'm not sure there's any way to stop that momentum. Not even sure we want to stop the momentum. But once that gets going in a few years, this might may all become moot. We may all be running everything we have on OpenStack anyway because we've built all those features in. Yeah, and, and, and it's not just features people are looking mm -hmm. for. You know, they're looking for stability. They're looking for yep. ease of use. And obviously, you know, today, things are a little bit complicated. But as more ease of use comes into OpenStack, I think that'll... That'll help a lot. Um, okay, so next question. I don't have a timer here, by the way, so if you guys 
<laughs> Let me know. Don't worry, they, they turn off the lights. They do, is, that, is that how it happens? <laughs> Shut off okay. your mic when the time <laughs> Blinking them. <laughs> okay, and apparently my necklace was too loud for one of those type of mics, but this has the added benefit of, you know, if I need to <laughs> clonk it's anybody over the head. Tool, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so next uh, myth, OpenStack is a product. Well, I don't know if we, we can call these things myths, but, um, or maybe we could also just talk about um, what the best approach to productizing OpenStack would be, because I mean, I, there's a lot of vendors here, there's a lot of OpenStack distros, I'm sure you guys have, have one each in the audience, um, and a couple on stage here. So um, why don't we start with, actually, you wanna take that one, Mark? Sure. So Blue Box took the approach of trying to make a digestible uh, implementation of OpenStack and productize private cloud as a service. And in our model, the first thing we brought to market was hosted private cloud as a service. So your cloud, truly single tenancy on dedicated hardware in our data center. So we would manage and implement a, a running deployment of OpenStack and dedicate it to your environment all the way down to the hardware level. Uh, the only thing shared is, is the top of rack networking gear. Uh, you could have physical firewalls in front of it, and, and, and that whole model was in the pursuit of working with OpenStack, not on OpenStack. Don't force yourself to develop an expertise in something that's not your core business. So that was kind of the, the, approach, of, or the approach to helping people get the most value out of OpenStack without having to uh, stray from what their core business is focused on, whatever application that may be. I guess one of the questions is what, what, what actually defines a product, right? Um, and I think there are many ways to define a product. I would say one of the ways though, right, especially in the enterprise space is product is something that someone provides support for, right? So if you look at the OpenStack project, who provides the support? No one single vendor, it's actually a group of people, but no one at the end of the day owns, the, you know, owns that support for that for the, if you're running OpenStack you know, stable release in your environment, no one's responsible <laughs> outside yourself for making sure that product works with everything, every piece of gear that you have. So that's, so to productize something, and one way to uh, look at that is to, uh, someone at the distribution vendor says, I'll take the OpenStack code, I'll package it up, test it, make sure it works with all the, with the list of gear, and we'll provide support for it all the way through. That, so in that sense, then OpenStack, the OpenStack project is not a product until a distribution vendor makes it into a product. And, in our, and I'm also so fond of saying, if, you, if you're out there running OpenStack yourself, the code from, from, a, uh, from stable release or from trunk, and, and, and then you're saying, well, I don't, I don't have a product because we're just running that from, from a stable release, you have a product, you, just, you created the product, you've, you've effectively become your, a software vendor for your own company. And you're responsible for support and lifecycle of that product. Um, I think I, I'll add to that. Uh, that. That's actually a great answer. So uh, again, let's explore what's a product, right? In my mind, a product is something that comprehensively meets the requirements of the user. Mm -hmm. And we see three types of users, uh, I, uh, cloud architects, IT architects, whose main job is to deploy OpenStack. And that needs to be made really easy. There are, um, even though you can say OpenStack is unopinionated, you ultimately do have to make choices in terms of what hardware do I use, how do I configure my databases, how do I configure RabbitMQ, et cetera, et cetera, all the middleware. So ease of deployment for the, for the cloud architect. For the cloud operator, it's how easy is it to um, uh, manage at scale, right? Is it resilient? Does it really work? Uh, can I make changes? Uh, updates, the previous session was on upgrades, right? Things of that sort. And um, um, for the developer, it's how easily can I bring my workloads onto OpenStack? And uh, yesterday and day before was a lot of uh, discussion on sort of the app catalog. So I think those are the three things. I, I completely agree with Ken. Large uh, customers don't have to uh, go to a product vendor. They can do it themselves and uh, productize it Along, along these three vectors and support themselves. Uh, others uh, may want to consider third-party vendors for distributions and support. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't say just because it's not supported, it's not a product. I mean, there's lots of right, other elements, products yeah. out there. There's yeah. lots of products out there. There's lots of bad products. Mm -hmm. Lots of different types of products, but I think you know we get asked that question a lot too. Like, wh why would you do your own distro? And um, and I, I would just ask people. Okay, so I, just really quickly, show of hands here. When's the last time you guys went to Linux.org and downloaded your own version of Linux that you run? But you run Linux, right? So you wouldn't really necessarily do that with OpenStack.org. So I'm a, a little bit surprised that we get that question so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people just don't think about it like that. But I'm still waiting for someone to you know, answer, so why would you go to Linux.org and, and download that version of Linux? There are some people that might want to do that, uh, and they'd have good reasons for that, but our enterprise customers are generally not amongst them. Well, in the early days of Linux, that's exactly what everybody did, and it was, right. it was much like the OpenStack ecosystem now, where vendors are starting to come forward with distributions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Early stages is very different, but... Uh, um, and, and that's where we were, and, and now we're not so early stages anymore. Release 11, right? Um, so next myth or fact or something we're going to talk about. OpenStack is free. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to see show of hands. Who, who thinks OpenStack is free? <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're going to have to debate this one much, but, um, but Mark, take that anywhere you want. Okay. Uh, Again, the barrier to entry to deploying OpenStack is not the initial licensing fees, obviously. Uh, it is the staggering learning curve it takes to successfully operate it, uh, whatever distribution you're using. Uh, and the, the whole concept of uh, getting this free software uh, and attempting to run it and expecting it not to have a ripple effect of long-term support needs or long-term uh, uh, issues is, is the myth I think we're, we're really going for here, we're really trying to talk about. And what is the best way to uh, gain value out of OpenStack without incurring uh, a huge uh, technical debt uh, in, in what it takes to, to, to operate this platform? Um, so again, that goes back to the, the varying schools of thought. Do you, do you go with a product that is a defined distro from a company that's willing to support it long term, or do you go with somebody who will operate or run a vanilla version of OpenStack for you? Uh, and what is the best way to price and package or, or uh, consume this product uh, that is free in some form or not so free in another? Yeah, uh, part, of, part of the problem. <laughs> is that you still need humans, right, yeah. to run technology. So you're either going to pay for it, you're either going to pay to the humans who are upfront productizing things, right, so, so you're paying a vendor to do that, or you're paying your own people, however many engineering man hours it needs to actually productize the OpenStack for you. But either way, you're paying somewhere along the way. It's a matter of is it CapEx or is it OpEx. So. That's exactly what we are seeing. Um, and this ties into the previous question, is OpenStack a product? If it were an open source product, uh, it would be free, but it's, it's an open source project. So uh, if you choose to do it yourself, then like Ken said, you need an engineering team that's uh, working on OpenStack, pulling those bits in, configuring it, having your own CI, uh, CI-CD pipeline, uh, or uh, you work with a vendor. So either way, you have to pay your engineers or a distribution. Okay, and we do find that our customers are willing, particularly, again, that the customer I was speaking with this morning who does want to move away from uh, VMware for cost reasons, but is also very willing to pay for the stability and the high availability and the, the you know, six nines and things like that. So um, security, another thing people are pretty willing to pay for because the cost of not having it is pretty high. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, number four. Everyone should follow Trunk. Yeah. I can take it. So, uh, there are three approaches here um, in terms of following the Trunk. And I'm interpreting it as how close you are to Trunk. Mm -hmm. There may be other ways to interpret the question. You could be at the bleeding edge. You know, every update that comes out, you consume it. You could be at the other extreme where you're skipping releases and we have customers who are still on Grizzly and Havana. 
and I've skipped uh, you know, Icehouse and, and debating about Juno. Uh, and then you have people who are every six months, they stay in cadence with OpenStack releases and, and uh, they upgrade and that's how they, that's the distance they keep from the trunk. And it really depends on the business, right? If OpenStack is a business differentiator, so we are not talking about the agility and applications on top of OpenStack. If OpenStack fundamentally is a differentiator for your business, then by all means, stay at the bleeding edge uh, and take the risk of you know, issues that may come up and, and, and um, have the, the tooling processes and the people to consume it. If on the other hand, you are in a heavily, heavy uh, compliance type business where certifying different versions of OpenStack is a big burden, then feel free to skip. Um, but frankly, I think most people we are finding are somewhere in the middle. I agree with that uh, almost entirely, but I think it also can be interpreted based on the use case. Uh, are, you, are you running production workloads, or are you running uh, dev test, or are you, are you using this as a sandbox environment in some form? And that would fundamentally impact how much risk you're okay mm -hmm. with. Uh, and, and the bleeding edge uh, inherently has more risk. It just doesn't have the, the legs and the, and the amount of testing behind it. So, you, I mean, you could be running multiple instances of OpenStack, and you could be uh, upgrading one ahead of the other to watch that happen. Uh, but, but our customers um, sometimes have, have stayed uh, on an older release because they're not comfortable taking the outage and doing the upgrade until it's been vetted uh, for a few more months. Yeah, yeah one, th one uh, thing I like to try to clear up too is like, uh, I talk to a lot of people and they seem to get confused between trunk versus stable release. When they say mm -hmm. trunk, they really mean stable release. So when, when, when OpenStack, when the project releases every six months, we're releasing a, essentially a snapshot, right, of, of the code at a given time that we think it's stable, so that's stable release. And, but then we're always iterating and fixing bugs and, and doing things like that. So you, what most uh, distribution vendors do is when they roll out a distribution, it's based on that stable release. Right? They're not typically then changing that release every, every day based on new code that's in trunk. So that's one thing. If you are a customer that wants to stay in trunk, try to keep up the trunk. So uh, when I was at Rackspace, uh, the, our public cloud always tr actually try to be within two weeks of trunk. Right. The, most of the time, they, they didn't get there. They probably within a few months. But even to try to even get close to that, you would need to make, have a, uh, you know, I'll use the buzzword, DevOps mm -hmm. <laughs> type of uh, structure in place, right, where you can do continuous integration that you have to do, be able to keep doing automated testing. Most customers, to be honest, most enterprise customers I know don't have that in place, right? They, they typically take months just to certify a piece of firmware for their storage array. So, uh, you're not gonna, so for those customers, there's no, there's no possibility that they could stay close to Trump. So. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there, we definitely have two types of customers, and, and, and most of us have two you know, different distros, right? A community version that does stay very close to Trump, and there's definitely a, a community of people that appreciate that, but our larger enterprise customers appreciate the more stability, you know, they'll, they don't want the risk. Mm -hmm. They want the stability. They, they're okay even being a whole cycle behind is what we're finding for that one too. Okay, last question before we open it up to you guys. Um, this isn't really a, this isn't really a myth, but um, <laughs> Jesse, I mentioned we did this in a bar, right? Really late at night. Um, so if I'm reading my uh, cocktail napkin slash coaster correctly, the last thing was OpenStack works, exclamation point. Um, but uh, you know, I think actually we don't have to debate that. We know OpenStack works. So I suppose it depends on what we mean by that. We obviously there's very large OpenStack, you know, production applications and and huge uh, websites like Walmart.com that are all running on OpenStack and PayPal and so many others that we've heard at this conference uh, give wonderful testimonials. So we know OpenStack works. We know there's um, a lot of activity out there. So uh, I guess if there's another side to that question, do you guys want to take a stab at it? I'd be happy to uh, take a first swing, but. Uh... I think the core of that question is, again, going back to the amount of effort it takes to get started and the technical debt and the, the learning curve it takes to successfully run OpenStack at scale. Mm -hmm. it, it is inherently 
a little challenging. You are going to learn things. You are going to, you are going to have to invest heavily in, in making it operate and making it work. And uh, I, mean, I, I work with a team of engineers who are constantly uh, learning new sort of best practices of how to run our, our you know, dozens of, of, of customers' private instances of OpenStack and, and constantly finding new use cases and new issues. And, and if you were to do that running only one uh, cloud and, and only one yourself, just the, the pace of the education and, and sort of self-understanding uh, uh, of how to operate your cloud would be slower. Uh, and it's just, uh, I think that the question really is about the learning curve it takes to successfully operate uh, a project mm -hmm based piece of software versus a product based piece of software. So I can take a cut at it. So I have a friend and his definition of works is very simple. If it's tested, it works. If it has not been tested, it doesn't work. So the way I interpret this question is, it goes back to the, the product point again, is uh, you have to make a certain set of choices on your hardware, what storage are you going to use? What networking strategy? Um, what servers are you going to use? What middleware? How are you going to configure all that middleware, your databases? And that combination, has that been tested for HA, for security, for performance, for scale, um, functional testing, negative testing? And if the answer to all of these questions is yes, then it works. If the, the answer is no, then using my friend's definition, no. So, uh, and that, that again, the burden of testing either goes to the, to the user if they use open source bits or to a distribution vendor like, like Mirantis if you choose to use a distribution. So I'll just use an analogy. If it, if, if the question is, does open, is it open stack just software that works? Uh, the analogy would be, if it just worked, it would be a Mac. Um, if you're trying to run it off of a trunk, you're trying to do Ubuntu desktop, or not oh, Fedora desktop, sorry. If you're, if you're trying to run it off a stable release, it's probably an Ubuntu desktop. If, but, but mainly, if you're trying to run it from a, from a distribution vendor, it's probably like a Windows, through that, Windows XP machine. Right? A little bit of tuning, but mostly it works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as promised, uh, I think we have a few more minutes to open it up to you guys. If you can make your way to the one microphone in the middle, uh, that would be great. If you can't, we will do our best to repeat the question that you asked so everyone can hear it. Question from my friend in the front row. Yeah, so uh, we are aware that companies like eBay and uh, Comcast would eventually or may have even uh, achieved a positive ROI, right? We don't know when or, mm -hmm. or so although that there is so much of complexity and it's so man, uh, manpower intensive from an application standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint as well, where do you think is the tipping point for most enterprises who are not as large as them, but who are not too small also, right, to, to move away from whatever they have now and to adopt uh, OpenStack? So what is the tipping point? You know, where, where, where do you think are the levers that they should say that, okay, if I have done those five things, oh, I should move to OpenStack. Because it's a lot of work, right? And they're not at the scale of eBay or, mm -hmm. yep. or Walmart or, or Okay, so the question, so we, we've seen the numbers from um, eBay, Walmart, the, not all the numbers, but, um, but they have stated, reported that they've achieved positive ROI from implementing OpenStack. And uh, I believe the question is, if, where is the tipping point to, to get there? Uh, if you're gonna- To even adopt, to even think of going towards OpenStack. All right, so I like- can't do a, I can't do a dipstick. I have to move in lock, stock, and barrel. Of course, you know, I have to think about infrastructure, I have to think about people putting in into application space, everything. And you wanna know before you do that when you're gonna achieve your ROI. Okay, Amar, you want to take that? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. And whenever I hear the term super user, I, I cringe a little bit because that means users are ruled out, are, are, are not included in that group, right? So actually, uh, 
we have customers who are realizing benefits of OpenStack at as little as 15 nodes. And these nodes include OpenStack controllers, they include storage nodes, and compute nodes. So at a very small scale, um, if your goal is to sort of get uh, app developer agility and uh, uh, cost savings in terms of IT effort, you know, manual labor, manual work, um, you can get that at, at a very small scale. Uh, if you are trying to get cost savings over, say, AWS on a sustained basis, again, so the skills are, are not, you don't have to be a super user, is my point. I think there's uh, some risk in, in answering this question uh, without a clear understanding of, of how you calculate a return on investment. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's in, inappropriate to really say that there is a clear function or a clear equation uh, for, for somebody to evaluate when they would gain uh, a return on or, or be able to, to appropriately decide whether or not they want to invest in OpenStack because uh, the capital expense is one side, the operational expense is another. CapEx is something that's relatively straightforward to, to calculate. Operational expense is astonishingly complicated. Uh, so how you, how, I mean, these, these large companies might be getting a return on investment. They might be uh, seeing some uh, additional utility by running OpenStack at scale and, and, and achieving what they have, but how they got to that conclusion is a staggering number of assumptions on, on, uh, on, on how they calculated uh, that return. So it would take uh, an evaluation of exactly what kind of IT capabilities uh, your individual company has, and then decide how would you best consume this technology that is available, and how would you best get the pieces of it that, that are most effective for, for your use case. Uh, basically, my, my answer is I don't really have anything to point at as a tipping point, or, or, or we don't have enough data mm -hmm. to be able to say when you can make an educated guess because it is so wildly different depending on the organization. And how much of it is it gonna be running in a public cloud versus a private cloud, and, and are you gonna be running a PaaS layer and building applications on the top, and what does your whole cloud environment look like? So every cloud environment, from what, I've told, what I can tell from customers we've talked to is wildly different. So tough to just blanket answer that question. But I, I would say don't, don't get uh, discouraged if, if the scale is small, I think is the right. point. Yeah. You, you should consider OpenStack. I mean, if the scale is three nodes, and of course it doesn't make sense, yeah. but you know, if you are 15, 20 nodes, feel free. I think it'll work. Take the free version. And even, yeah. even at a small scale, there are competing ways to consume the product. Do you, do you go with a uh, hosted private cloud or do you go with a distro on your own hardware? Do you, right. do you take a path that is capital expense or operational expense even at three nodes? Yeah. Uh, because it's a very different equation, a very different conversation. And I mean, on, on obviously on one end of it is the blue box product where it's 100% operational expense in, in a leased private tenant or you know, private implementation and single tenant implementation in our data center. But there's steps all the way along the way uh, to buying a license and buying the hardware and taking space and building it not and running it yourself. So I mean, it's, it, again, it's a, it's a hard slider to identify. Analysts are trying to, trying to answer this question too. Was it 451 that just produced a report and you know, one of their takeaways was, you know, do you have an army of engineers who actually are qualified on OpenStack to build this stuff or are you gonna have to go train people or get those people or hire those people? And so there's a lot of different things yeah. that go into these, these costs. But that is a good report if you wanna read one report on that very topic. First of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, tackling something tough, and thanks for agreeing not to agree. Appreciate that. Um, if you had to describe you know, clients that are most readily adopting OpenStack, and if you had to give them sort of a personality type, could you describe that for a second? Uh, I would say, well, when I was at Rackspace, I think the overwhelming uh, demographic of the people who adopted OpenStack were tended to be startups, yep. you know, people who are not afraid of take, you know, again, and this is a couple of years ago, right? So people who weren't afraid to take on a new technology um, and wanted to, and had a lot of engineering people who were willing to kind of get under the hood a little bit if they need to. Um, 
I think that's starting to change a little bit, but I think, like you pointed out, it still, there's still some engineering that, you know, you need to still have to have folks who know, have a lot of technical know-how. So um, I, I think the companies that have done well are the uh, companies that have um, technical groups that aren't completely siloed, right? Um, that have a fairly, uh, what, are, what I call uh, T-shaped people. <laughs> Basically, they're people who know storage, networking, and, and compute, and maybe data, you know, a, a wide range of technical skills, but maybe have one domain area where they are better than others. You need a bunch of those T-shaped people. They're successful, um, as opposed to I, so the guy who goes, I know how to create a LUN, <laughs> and that's all I really know how to do. <laughs> I think those people don't do very well, that, all those companies. In, in general, I, I, would, I would agree that uh, the, the typical consumer is somebody who uh, is comfortable with some risk. Uh, not enough risk to go, uh, go it alone and try to build it entirely themselves like it may, may have been two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now, uh, OpenStack is now becoming enough of a known quantity, uh, enough of a, a relied upon technology that, okay, this is something, this is something that we can, we can bring with a more comfortable level of risk. But again, the, the customers and the unifying trait is that they are, they are okay with, with uh, a project-based uh, product. Um, so let me take a cut at that. So the customers we are seeing most successful with OpenStack are willing to undergo what I, in my mind, I call a quadruple transformation. <laughs> so the transformation is Organizational, so American Express earlier presented today and uh, Justin talked about the org at length. So first of all, there has to be willingness to put together, together a cross-functional org team, uh, cloud team, cross-functional cloud team uh, that's going to work on this. The second transformation is apps, going from 2.5 or non-cloud native to cloud native. Uh, the third one is willingness to adopt a DevOps type mindset going from water scrum fall to um, sort of true CICD. And the fourth is willingness to take a risk on the infrastructure side from traditional uh, IT to uh, uh, OpenStack, which is open source and, 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 uh, and a cloud-based approach. Thank you. Uh -oh. Hi, guys. Um, so being that OpenStack has, has achieved a base level of maturity in the marketplace, in your conversations with customers, do you still find that there's some confusion in the market between whether OpenStack provides a control plane or a data plane? And do you feel that they have any confusion about to what, whether their choices impact capital expense, operational expense, planning, and budget in their projects? Who said, uh-oh? You sounded excited to answer this one. <laughs> I, I can go. I, I think uh, absolutely we see tremendous confusion. In fact, the first question that you teed up, difference between virtualization and cloud. People are confused. I think the 6,500 people here uh, get it, but when we go outside the boundaries of this summit, there's, I think there's a lot of confusion in what is OpenStack, why should I use it, what benefit does it provide me, how is it different than virtualization, uh, what is an overlay network, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what you... I don't even know if I'd, if I'd say that the 6,500 people here get it. We've had a lot okay. of confusion here, and I've heard a lot of different definitions of things, and, okay. and, and we spent a lot of time defending OpenStack, which, uh, you know, you think everyone's here at the conference, they're all believers, but um, I don't know that I would uh, uh, necessarily go that far yet. Um, but I think we will get there. I think people are, I think it's going to be, in a few years, the thing that you, we'd ask, why are you not doing this? Like, I think we will get there. I mean, the need for automation, the need for, you know, we called it the new style of IT, but just really getting away from kind of that more traditional way of computing. Your third point, uh, the CICD stuff and the DevOps stuff, that's massive, and you gotta go there. Um, the, the change of your business model, the change of how you do your accounting, it's just something that's going to have to happen. You're not really gonna have a choice, but that'll happen. It'll be a little painful when you're doing, when you're making that transformation, but companies will figure out how to do it and they'll get there. And maybe companies who are brand new and they're you know, 
going in here from the beginning have a little bit of an advantage, but um, the, the large enterprise companies will get there. And we see it working. I mean, yeah. we, you know, CERN has been on it for years, and there's um, many examples out there of, of people who have, you know, sort of bit the bullet, did it early, and, and it's working. Yeah, I, I, um, I think I have, I'm having a lot less of the open stack is not a hypervisor discussion. I used to have a lot of that. I don't have that so much anymore. I think that uh, the issue we still have to deal with is basically a, um, Conway's law in action, right? People, you know, uh, which is kind of the, the, the way you develop software uh, perhaps it kind of matches your organizational structure. Most people's organizational structure doesn't align itself to a self-service, elastic on-demand type of uh, platform to serve the developers. And so, so when, when you don't change your organization structure and, and try to adapt OpenStack, then you know, I've, I've, got, I've got customers who are like, I like OpenStack, but can you, can you tell me how I can set it up in such a way that uh, when a developer wants a VM, um, I, can get a, I, I can approve it first and get three other people to approve it. And as long as I can get it in the two days, they'll be okay. So obviously that's not an optimal use <laughs> of a cloud platform. Okay, did I see my friend in the back giving us a signal? Yes. Okay, well then I uh, definitely want to thank Amar and Mark and Ken and I'm Lisa and I want to thank you guys. This will be up on YouTube within the hour if you want to like revisit it or tell your friends, I'm told. Um, and thank you and enjoy the rest of your summit. Thank you. Thanks.